The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line.
The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode.
Hello, everyone. Happy Wednesday. I'm excited you're here. If you can hear me, would you just let me know in the question box if you are on GoTo or um, there in the chat if you're on Facebook or YouTube. Just let me know that you can hear me okay before we get started. Just making sure everyone is able to hear okay before we get going. Hello, welcome, Bahara, Adamazi, awesome, thank you. Thank you so much for letting me know. Well, welcome, it is Wednesday. Well, it's Wednesday for me. Um, so my name is Jennifer Bonner. I'm gonna be joining you for our um, free webinar Wednesday. Today, we're gonna be talking about health promotion and maintenance. We're gonna be testing your nursing knowledge. Oh my goodness, a test. Probably not what you were expecting. Please do not panic. It is okay. So the NCLEX exam assesses your ability to provide safe and effective care, right? It's looking at various nursing situations. Basic care and comfort is one of those categories that the exam is going to evaluate. So it's going to include aspects of nursing care, fundamentals, promoting well-being, comfort of patients, and there's some key topics under basic care and comfort on the NCLEX exam, okay, that we're going to look at. Well, today, um, we are going to just kind of do some rapid fire. We're going to look through several questions. We're going to be using um, Slido, so we'll talk about that here in just a minute. Remember, the NCLEX exam may present scenarios that are going to require you to apply critical thinking skills, apply your nursing knowledge in order to provide safe and effective care. So it's important to have a solid understanding of the principles of, of what we're going to talk about today. So let's get started, shall we? Let's open up Slido. If you have never used Slido before, um, you can either scan the QR code that you see here, or the other thing that you can do is log into slido.com, and you're going to enter in the code um, capital F W W Archer Review. So free webinar Wednesday, Archer Review will get you into Slido. And once you are there, please let me know where are you joining us from? Oh, Carmen, we are so excited to walk alongside you. Congratulations on your new title of RN. That's awesome. Canada, Texas, Ontario, Germany. Okay. Canada is the big one here. Canada. All right. West Palm Beach, Florida. I bet it's much warmer there than where I am. Vegas, California, Calgary, Edmonton, Halifax, Saudi Arabia. Welcome. Chicago, Arizona. Many of you are joining us on YouTube, Boston, Los Angeles, Philippines, welcome. It is probably the middle of the night for you. Kenya, California, Arizona, Qatar, UK, recently visited there, it is beautiful. Toronto, Wisconsin, more Calgary, Kenya, Houston, more Canada, Ghana, welcome. We have students from all over the world. This is pretty awesome. I am so excited that you all are here. Saudi Arabia, more Germany, awesome. Well, let's get going. So like I said, we're going to talk about several different um, aspects. We're going to just do some, we're going to cover several um, areas of the NCLEX and just kind of asking some questions to seeing where your knowledge rests. Now, one thing that I'd recommend today is that if we're going through a topic that you are just like, Jennifer, I have no idea. I don't know if I missed this or if it's just... Um, still sticky to me, write that down so that later on you can go back and review those sticky subjects because that's really what's going to help you to solidify that information in your mind so that you can remember for the NCLEX. 
So let's get going, shall we? Let's start off with growth and development. Growth and development is one of those large buzz topics that we see covered, tested highly in the NCLEX world. So first question, this stage of development, according to Eric Erickson, involves developing a sense of trust or mistrust. So we're gonna break down this question. We're talking about Erickson's stages of development. Which stage of development involves developing a sense of trust or mistrust? So make sure you are in Slido. Welcome to those from New York, Nigeria, Kuwait, Florida. We're excited you're here. Kenya, Toronto. Awesome. Okay. I am seeing several right answers coming in. Awesome. I'm seeing infancy, I'm seeing zero to 18 months, I'm seeing zero to one infant. I'm seeing sensory stage, infants, infants, neonatal. Excellent. I'm seeing several right answers. I see several still typing. So we're going to wait just a minute. Infancy, zero to one. 0 to 12, 1 to 12, 0 to 8 months. Okay, let's look at this. So when we are talking about Erickson stages of development, we are looking at that infancy stage. When we're talking about trust versus mistrust, okay? And according to Erickson, infancy is 0 to 1 years of age, okay? I want you to remember that Erickson says this is infancy or zero to one. So for those of you who said zero to 12 months, excellent, or zero to one, absolutely, perfect. Now, what is trust and what is mistrust? Well, basic trust is a child's expectations that their needs are gonna be met by whoever it is that's taking care of them. Mom and dad, grandma, grandpa, aunt and uncle, um, you know, a, another caregiver. It is their idea that this person's gonna take care of me. They're gonna get me what I need. If I cry, they're gonna give me my bottle. If I cry, they're gonna change my diaper. If I'm lonely, they're gonna pick me up, okay? Trust, over time, they're gonna develop this. Now, distrust, is the result of those needs being unmet, okay? So this impresses on them that the world is difficult, the world is unreliable. So that is infancy, that's zero to one. So my little one at home, developing that when I cry, somebody's gonna come get me, okay? So that is trust versus mistrust, and according to Erickson, that is an infancy zero to one. Awesome job. Let's look at our next question. According to Paget, so oh, we're gonna change gears just a little bit here. During this stage of cognitive development, children develop the ability to think logically and understand conversation. So let's break that down a little bit. We are asking, being asked about Paget here and asking what stage are they developing the ability to think logically and understand con observation. Hmm. See several of you starting to write here. What stage of cognitive development are we talking about? So remember, we're switching from Erickson to Paget. Paget is looking at that cognitive development Okay, I'm seeing concrete operational. I'm seeing 12 to adult, school age, seven to 11, school age, concrete operational, adulthood. I'm seeing several right answers coming through. Many of you, it is obvious you have already grasped this concept. Seeing two to three, pre-operational, 
Okay, well, let's look at this one together. So according to Paget, when children are developing this level of cognitive development, they are looking at concrete operational. Okay, so this is seven to 11. For those of you who said seven years to 11 years, you got it right. Or if you said concrete operational. Now, remember, if you don't remember going through this, if this is still a little sticky, make sure that you write this down so that you are able to go back and kind of um, review these concepts later. So what we're talking about here is we're mastering that use of logic in concrete ways, okay? The word concrete tells us that we're talking about something tangible, okay? Something that can be seen, touched, something they can experience directly, okay? So this is Paget's concrete operational stage, seven to 11 years old. Excellent job. During this stage of development, adolescents struggle to establish their identity and may experience role confusion. Okay, so we're talking about a stage of development where adolescents hmm, struggle to establish their identity and may experience role confusion. So we have some keywords in there that kind of give us a little bit of an idea of what we're talking about here. So adolescence, okay. So what stage of development are we in? Or what ages are we looking at? So we are looking at stages and age range. So let me know what you think seeing some teenagers, identity versus role confusion, young adult, seeing adolescence, young adult, I'm seeing seven to 11, 12 to 18. Okay, many of you are getting this one. So we are looking at, and I've seen this con come through several times. Many of you are getting one piece or the other, but we want to make sure that we are able to identify the two pieces and be able to put them together. So our answer here is identity versus role confusion, and that is 12 to 18 years old, okay? So this is where that adolescent is wondering, who am I? Okay, so during this time, they're conflicted with lots of values, ideas of who they are, who they should be, and what they think. So this is that identity versus role confusion, 12 to 18 years old. Excellent job, excellent job. All right, next question. This age group often experiences general, um, generativity versus stagnation where individuals focus on their careers and family relationships. So we are looking for an age group or an age range here that they are often experiencing gener uh, generative, generativity. I am having trouble with words today. Generativity versus stagnation. And this is where they are focusing on their careers, their family relationships. So again, when we're looking at these types of questions, make sure that you look through the question and see, are there any key words in here that can kind of help me figure out what's going on here? What is the question asking about? I'm seeing late adulthood, 39 to 64. You are really close. Middle adult, middle age, young adult, 40 to 64. Adulthood, many of you are getting this. So this question isn't asking um, for which um, theorists we're talking about. This one is actually asking us for an age range. And many of you I see are getting this one. Identity, okay. Before 65, middle adult. Okay, so let's look at this one. So this is middle adulthood. So we're, we're looking at 40 years old. This is about 65 years old. So generativity is referring to making a positive impact. 
making a contribution to the world. So maybe this is raising children. Maybe this is being a mentor to someone else, helping them come along, giving them, you know, taking them under the wing, um, engaging in some type of a meaningful work. OK, that is generativity versus stagnation. On the other hand, is they're kind of stuck, maybe in a rut. They don't feel like they're being productive. OK, they don't really have a sense of purpose. So that's what we're talking about here. Generativity versus stagnation. So generativity, they're making an impact. They're doing something to give back versus stagnation. If Think about something that's stagnant. It's not moving a whole lot. Um, generally, if you have, let's say you have a goldfish. Um, I had a goldfish growing up. Um, kind of embarrassed to tell you, but I had this goldfish and I forgot to feed him and I forgot to change his water. And all of a sudden you have um, this nastiness growing because that water has been stagnant for so long. So they're stuck. They're not productive. There's no sense of purpose there. Excellent job. Okay, <clears throat> we're gonna switch gears a little bit again and look at Kubler-Ross. These are the five stages of grief according to Kubler-Ross. Do you remember what those five stages of grief are? What are the five stages of grief according to Kubler-Ross? Hi, Mohammed. Today we are looking at some rapid fire questions. Looking at health promotion and maintenance. I'm seeing several correct answers. Welcome for those of you who are just joining us. Go ahead and hop into Slido. If you're just joining us, something you can do is you can either scan that QR code there on your screen with your smartphone, or if you um, need to, you can just log into slido.com and type in um, FWW Archer Review, and that should get you in for the day. If you're unable to, you can go ahead and pop that either in the question box if you're joining us on GoToWebinar or in the chat box if you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube. And I am seeing several excellent answers. This one, many of you are getting perfect. Excellent, excellent. Let's look here. According to Kubler-Ross, the five stages of grief are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Did you get it right? I know many of you did. You guys are doing awesome. So let's, let's switch topics a little bit, shall we? Let's talk about health promotion. This type of prevention focuses on promoting health and preventing diseases before they occur. What type of prevention, hmm, focuses on promoting health and preventing diseases before they occur? Hi, Shrusty. So you can either scan that QR code with your iPhone or your smart device. There's a QR code that should be there on your screen. Or you can go to slido.com and type in the code FWW, those are all in caps, and then Archer Review, and that should get you in. All right, I'm seeing lots of excellent answers. I'm seeing primary. Hello, Victor, we're glad you're here. Excellent. This one is not stumping you today. Excellent job. Awesome. Yeah, you're right. So this is primary prevention. Can you think of any examples of primary prevention? Let me know in the chat or the question box, depending on where you're joining us. So remember, with primary prevention, we are focusing on promoting health and preventing diseases before they occur. Any examples you can think of for primary prevention? Excellent job, Helen, Lulu, excellent, good job. Vaccinations, okay, immunization, I like it. Very good. 
All right, this type of prevention focuses on preventing diseases from getting worse and chronic treatment. What type of prevention is looking at preventing diseases from getting worse? So we already have the disease, we don't want it to keep progressing, and we're also looking at chronic treatment. What type of prevention? Many of you have got some excellent ideas for primary prevention that is awesome. Basically, before it ever starts, we want to get it. We want to prevent it from um, from starting at all. Okay, I'm seeing secondary. I'm seeing tertiary. Hmm going back and forth this one's going to be close secondary or tertiary someone says primary okay so we talked about how primary is preventing it before it starts in this case we already have the disease and we are trying to prevent it from getting worse this also involves chronic treatment so what prevention prevent type of prevention excuse me is looking at preventing diseases from getting worse. <clears throat> All right, perfect. Many of you got this one. Tertiary prevention. So basically they already have the disease, they just don't want it to progress, so they're taking action. So chronic treatments, okay, excellent job. Many of you got this one, but there was a lot of um, a lot of debate between secondary and tertiary. So make sure that if this is still a sticky subject that you write this down to make sure to go back and check it out. All right, this vaccine is recommended for infants to protect against potentially serious diseases like diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. So remember what we talked about earlier, when we're looking at questions, we wanna make sure that we look into the question to see are there any clues in here that might give it away what they're looking for? Hmm, it looks like there are a couple clues here. So this vaccine is recommended for infants to protect against potentially serious diseases like diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. What vaccine are we looking at? Adamazi, excellent. So we are, we already have the disease with tertiary. Primary, we are trying to prevent the disease at all. Seeing DTAP, DTAP, DTAP. Seeing TDAP, hmm. DTAP, TDAP, huh. All right, let's check it out. If you said DTAP, you are correct. So the Tdap and the DTAP vaccines help protect against the same diseases, okay? But they're used for different age groups. So Tdap is recommended for older children and adults, and DTAP is recommended for infants and young children. Tdap is one that we recommend um, in pregnancy, even if mom is up to date in her um, immunizations, we recommend the Tdap vaccine towards the third trimester in order for her to be able to pass that immunity onto her unborn child until they can get their Dtap vaccine. Okay, so they're protecting against the same things, but one is used for older and one are used for younger children. Excellent job. Many of you got that one. All right, what immunization is recommended for children to protect, prevent a con, um, contagious viral disease, which if not protected against can lead to complications like pneumonia and encephalitis? Hmm, what disease can lead to complications like pneumonia and encephalitis? There's an immunization for it that we recommend for children. What might that vaccination be? You guys are doing awesome. Many of you are already putting in some correct answers here. So let me go over that Tdap versus 
DTAP again. So DTAP um, is for our um, infants and young children, and TDAP is for our older children and adults. Okay, so though they're protecting against the same thing, but we use one for different age groups is basically what it is. Okay, so we are looking for an immunization this time that is going to be recommended for children to pretend, protect against or prevent a contagious viral disease, which if not protected against can lead to complications like pneumonia and encephalitis. What do you think? Hmm. PCV, pneumococcal, BCG, I'm seeing pneumococcal, PCV. All right, let's check out our answer here. This is the MMR, so measles, mumps, and rubella. Excellent job for those of you who got that one. MMR, measles, mumps, and rubella. All right, this screening test is recommended for women over the age of 40 to detect breast cancer. Okay, what screening test, so that gives you a clue, is recommended for women over the age of 40 to detect breast cancer. What do you think? I think a lot of you are gonna get this one. Feel confident here? Excellent job, yes. I'm seeing several of you putting your answers here in the question box, perfect. Absolutely, yes. So a self breast exam um, isn't, it is a screening tool, but we are talking about a test. So um, self breast exam, while it is a screening that women do at home and is recommended every month, um, generally recommended after um, the menstrual cycle is over. So after their period has ended, um, we do recommend that women do that um, to see if they can catch anything that is abnormal. Um, but this is asking about a screening test. So an actual test that we send them for would be the mammogram or mammography. So again, this is recommended for women over the age of 40. Screening tests that we send them for um, that's taking some digital images of the inside of the breast. Excellent job. Many of you got that one. All right, let's take a break for just a second. Let me brag on some of these amazing women that I get to work alongside every day. So have you ever had a topic that's still a little bit sticky or maybe you're just kind of feeling down? You're struggling with the questions and man, I don't even know how to answer this. And what is a bow tie? Have you ever been there? Because I have been there. Um, one of these, um, one of the great options that we have here at Archer is private tutoring. One on one, completely individualized. Our tutors are going to work alongside you to figure out one, what, what's going on? What do you need? Um, what's, where, where's the breakdown? Where are you struggling? We're able to provide you with an individualized study plan and figure out how can we walk alongside you to help you reach that finish line of passing the NCLEX? We have every day of the week available. We have amazing tutors, Allie, Emma, Lauren, Kate, Megan, Elizabeth, myself. We are all here to support you. We enjoy walking alongside students. Each of us has a um, different kind of specialty. I know Elizabeth, um, really focuses in on maternity. So if that's one of your struggles, she she might be there for you. I focus on maternity and test taking strategies, really encouraging students as they get ready to take that test, giving you confidence to um, be able to break down questions and to answer them appropriately. Because sometimes we may not even need to know everything that they're being asked in the question, but if we understand how to break it down, um, we will increase our chances of getting that question right. So if that's something that appeals to you, go ahead and scan our code here that will pull up our, um, 
our tutor calendar for you, kind of let you know what's available. It is $75 per hour. The more sessions you book at one time, the bigger the discount you will receive. And so this is a really great option for those of you who maybe are just getting started, or maybe this is um, maybe the third or the fourth time that you've taken the NCLEX and you're just kind of feeling in a rut. Remember that stagnation we were talking about earlier. This is totally normal, but please reach out. Let us know how we can help. Now let's get back to, let's look at diet and nutrition. Everybody's favorite. I'm hearing some groanings even through the screen here. All right, our first question. What is the body's main source of energy? What is the body's main source of energy? Hmm. Okay, I'm starting to see some answers coming in. The body's main source of energy. I'm seeing carbs. I'm seeing glucose. I'm seeing glucose, carbohydrates, carbs, 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 glucose, carbs. Carbohydrates. Carbohydrates, vitamin D. Okay, protein and carbs. Hi, Ashley. Are you asking about what time um, do we do our free webinar Wednesdays on YouTube? Protein, carbohydrates. Protein, glucose, food. Okay, so our body's main source of energy is carbohydrates. So basically, with what's happening is our body is using the carbohydrates that we eat and turning them into energy for us to continue doing our daily tasks. Excellent job. All right, these are the essential nutrients that provide energy support cell growth and repair the tissues. Hmm, essential nutrients. So something that the body needs that gives us energy, supports cell growth and repairs tissues. Let's see, I'm seeing vitamins, protein, carbohydrates. Protein. Look at you guys go. Many of you are getting these. So carbs is what the body uses for energy. We're asking which nutrients do we need that's going to give us energy, support cell growth, and repair tissues. And many of you are getting this. You guys are amazing. So what we are looking for here is, drum roll, Protein. So proteins are what our body uses not only for energy, but also to repair um, when things go wrong. Excellent job. Well, Angela, so our free webinar Wednesdays are offered. Um, our next one will be in two weeks, actually. So this fat hmm, is considered the bad fat and is associated with increased risk of heart disease. Hmm, did you know there's good fats and bad fats? Which fat are we talking about? So we are looking for a specific type of fat. This is a bad fat. And it actually is associated with increased risk of heart disease. Many of you are getting it. I'm seeing LDL, saturated fats, low density lipoprotein. You guys are amazing. You guys are getting these. Excellent job. So proud of you all. All right, so which fat is bad and considered and um, associated with an increased risk of heart disease? Well, it's our saturated fat. That is our bad fat. So what is our good fat? If our saturated fat 
is bad, then which one is our good fat? Let me know in the question box there if you're on GoTo or if you're in the chat box in Facebook or um, YouTube. Excellent. Yes, Minkle. So how I remember this is when I'm looking at labs and I'm thinking about good fat versus bad fat, one thing that I think about is if I have good fat, I'm happy. So we have an HDL, happy fat. Okay, so you're right. Our HDL is going to be our good fat. Great job. All right, this mineral is important for bone health and nerve function. It's commonly found in dairy products. Mm. This mineral is important for bone health and nerve function and is commonly found in dairy products. What do we think? This mineral is important for bone health, nerve function, and commonly found in dairy products. Many of you are getting this one. I'm seeing a lot of calcium, vitamin D, calcium. Excellent. So when I was growing up, they used to have this commercial that talked about drinking milk. It does your body good because it's the calcium in milk that helps us with bone health. So the mineral that's important for bone health and nerve function, commonly found in dairy products, is indeed calcium. Awesome job, guys. This is great. You guys are doing an amazing job. All right. These vitamins are water soluble and are important for maintaining healthy skin, mucous membranes, and vision. Hmm. So vitamins. So there must be more than one. They're water soluble and important for maintaining healthy skin, mucous membranes, and vision. Hmm. Interesting. What do you think? Healthy skin, mucous membranes, vision, they're water soluble. I'm seeing A, D, E, and K, vitamin C, vitamin A, vitamin A and D, vitamin A, D, E, and K, vitamin A, amino acids, vitamin A, A, D, E, and K, C and A, B and C. We have a lot of different vitamins, don't we? A, D, E, and K. We're looking for ones that are water soluble and are also important for maintaining healthy skin, mucous membranes, and vision. So those vitamins are going to be vitamins A, vitamin C, and vitamin E. So vitamin E is often one of those vitamins that um, providers will often encourage their clients to use if they um, have skin issues, just putting a little bit of vitamin E oil on. All right, so we talked a little bit about one-on-one -on -one tutoring, but what about our small group tutoring? Small group tutoring is a little bit different. It's a little less. Um, so this is $25 per hour. And what happens is it's kind of like a smaller class. So we are focusing on practice questions, things that you need to know in order to get those questions right. There are several that we offer. If you scan this QR code here, this will lead you to our small group calendar showing you what's available. I know this Friday in particular, I'm going to be leading an ins and outs of the NCLEX. It's a two hour small group. I'm super excited. Um, so we'll be talking about all things NCLEX, um, but we also have other topics like um, maternity, mental health, cardiac. Um, so if you are interested in one of those small groups, please go ahead and scan the QR code there um, and that will take you to where you can sign up for one of those small groups and you can see what's available. 
All right, so let's move to health screening and assessment. We talked a little bit about this earlier. We were talking about prevention strategies, but let's look at more of that screening and assessment. So what is the normal range for a resting heart rate in adults? So we know that between adults and children, this is a little bit different. So it's really important that we understand what our normals are, because if we understand the normals, then we are able to determine, OK, is this too low? Is this too high? And what do I do about those things? So if we know our normals, we are in a good place to kind of figure out, OK, what's going on? So what is our normal resting heart rate in adults? Many of you are getting this one. I was confident that you would. 60 to 90, 60 to 100, saw 60 to 99. Man, I thought I might stump you today, but I guess not. You're right, it is 60 to 100 beats per minute. So like I said, it's really important that you remember those normals, not only for adults, but also children. And then you also have normal um, vital signs, so normal heart rate for a fetus. So our normal for a fetus would be 110 to 160, and our normal for an adult is gonna be our 60 to 100. Excellent job. This is the recommended age for individuals to start regular colorectal cancer screening. Hmm, colorectal cancer screening. What age is recommended for individuals to start regular colorectal screening? So remember, there is a difference between those who have an increased risk, but here we're talking about the regular colorectal cancer screening. So just the average person, when would we want them to start that screening process? What age? Okay, I'm seeing 40s, I'm seeing 50s, I'm seeing 45, 45 and older, 45 and above, 50, 45, 40, 45, 40 to 60, 45 and over 40, I'm seeing several of those, 45, I'm seeing 50. Okay, so the recommended age for individuals to start colorectal screening, just the regular colorectal cancer screening is gonna be 50 years old. So many of you got that one. So this is 50 years old. Now, remember, if they have an increased risk, maybe they have a um, immediate relative that had colorectal cancer or passed away from colorectal cancer, then that might be a little bit earlier. But we are talking about just the average Joe regular colorectal screening. Excellent job. OK, this tool is used to assess a patient's pain intensity and to often used in healthcare settings. Hmm, what tool are we going to use to assess our client's pain intensity and something that we use in healthcare settings pretty often? Hmm. I wonder what tool is going to help us assess our client's pain intensity and it's something that we use quite frequently. A pain scale numeric pain scale, is it one to 10 pains, one to 10 scale, a pain scale zero to 10, numeric pain scale, number scale, pain scale, zero to 10 scale, client self-assessment scale, Okay, you guys are getting this pain rating scale, numeric, awesome. You guys are getting this, you guys are doing great. So in this case, that tool that we use to assess a patient's pain intensity and something that we often use in the healthcare setting is gonna be our pain scale, so our numeric Rating scale would be an option. Now, remember, we have several different options um, that is going to give us the same 
information, right? So maybe we have a child, maybe they're three years old, and I say, Johnny, tell me, how bad is your, your pain on a zero, scale of zero to 10? Johnny's going to look at me like I have three eyes. He's not going to understand what I'm saying. But maybe I give him a picture and I show him, um, here's a happy face. Here's an I'm okay face. And here's a I'm really sad face and I'm crying and it's terrible. Which one of these, how do you feel right now? How bad is your pain? And Johnny's going to be able to point to one of those. It's going to give us the same information, but just a little bit different. So remember, we want to make sure that these pain scales are going to um, fit our clients' needs. Excellent job. That one you guys got. Awesome job. This diagnostic test measures blood glucose levels over the past few months and is used to diagnose and manage diabetes. Hmm, we're looking at a diagnostic test looking at blood glucose levels. Huh, that sounds more like a long term versus a short term. What do you think? Ashley, I like that you added that faces scale for children. You are right. So what is that diagnostic test that measures blood glucose levels over the past few months used to diagnose and manage diabetes? Excellent. You guys got this one. You are right. It is our hemoglobin A1C. So our hemoglobin A1C gives us the average blood sugar level over the last three months. It helps us determine how we are able to help manage those with diabetes. Excellent job. All right, these are the main vital signs measured in healthcare. We look at heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, and what else? What are our main vital signs that we're going to look at in healthcare? So when you go to the doctor's office, when you go to the hospital, when we wake up someone in the middle of the night to check their vitals, what vitals are we checking? We're looking at their blood pressure. We're looking at their heart rate, their respiratory rate, and one more thing thing is major the main vital signs that we are looking at yes we're looking at vitals and there are main vital signs that we look at and many of you got it yep we already have pulse rate we have our heart rate or the pulse rate those are interchangeable terms our blood pressure respiratory rate and many of you got it temperature we could also say pain um, we do occasionally look at that O2 percentage, that O2 stats, um, but temperature or pain are those we look at. A lot of times what we will say is pain is our fifth vital sign. So those are our main ones that we're looking at. Blood pressure, temperature, heart rate, respirations. Excellent job. All right, so the other option that I would like to talk to you a little bit about today is our intense prep. Intense prep, this is our number one package for those who are repeat test takers. Maybe this is, um, you just got the news that you were unsuccessful in your first attempt. This is a great option for those of you that need something structured. So basically what we offer is a day-by-day -day plan that's going to guide you through lectures that you're able to watch, um, activities to complete, practice questions. You're gonna know what to do every step of the way. We also have small group tutoring sessions. They meet two times a week on Mondays and Tuesdays. We have small group tutoring sessions um, that the max amount of students we have in those are 20 per group. Um, Monday, we gear those sessions towards students' um, feedback, and then Wednesdays are geared more towards our high-yield NCLEX content. So you're getting a little bit of both. We have live reviews. We have um, three-hour sessions that meet every Tuesday and Thursday. There's a live tutor that you get to interact with, you get to chat with right there. We have a QBank access. So over 2,800 questions that um, include tutor mode. We have readiness assessments, which gauge how ready are you to go ahead and take the NCLEX. 
And then we also have a 1,000 page or more ebook um, that have all your slides, your worksheets, case studies, all things that are going to give you all the tools that you need to be successful. Our next start date, as you can see here, is November 27th. And you can scan that QR code there to get more information or to sign up. So we hope to see you with our next group. All right, let's look at immunizations and preventative care. We are almost done. What vaccine helps protect against a potentially life-threatening bacterial infection that can lead to paralysis and is given to children in multiple doses? This vaccine helps protect against life-threatening bacterial infection that can lead to paralysis and is given to children in multiple doses. What vaccination are we talking about here? You guys are doing great. I'm seeing some correct answers here. I'm seeing tetanus, I'm seeing OPV, I'm seeing tetanus, meningitis, polio, polio, I'm seeing polio and tetanus. Polio, OPV, meningitis. Lots of answers coming through. You guys are doing awesome. Many of you are getting this one. You're right. The vaccine that helps protect against potentially life-threatening bacterial infection that can lead to paralysis and is given to children in multiple doses is polio or IPV. That's the one we're looking for. Excellent job. This vaccine is recommended for older adults to reduce the risk of developing shingles, a painful skin rash caused by the reactivation of the chickenpox virus. So which vaccine do we give to older adults to help reduce their risk of developing shingles? That gives us a clue there. And shingles is a painful skin rash caused by the reactivation of the chickenpox virus. A lot of times this is painful, itchy. It's going to follow kind of the nerve line. Which vaccination do we give to older adults to reduce the risk of developing shingles? This one is a little bit kind of a give me. If you read the question carefully, you will see a really big hint in there. And many of you are getting it. Awesome job. So the vaccine that's recommended for older adults to reduce the risk of developing shingles, which is a painful skin rash caused by the reactivation of chickenpox virus, is the shingles vaccination. Um, we know that shingles is caused by herpes zoster, so we would also accept herpes zoster. Excellent job. Many of you got that one. In pregnant individuals, which vaccine is recommended to protect both the mother and the newborn from serious complications of the flu? Hmm, interesting. So we give this to mom to protect her and the newborn from complications of the flu. Isn't that interesting that mom is able to pass off that immunization to her baby until they can get their own. Remember we talked about this a little bit ago when we talked about the DTaP and the Tdap vaccine. We actually rem, rem, excuse me, recommend that women receive the Tdap vaccine during their pregnancy in order for um, their child to get that that benefit from them. So what vaccine do we recommend to protect both the mother and the newborn from serious complications of the flu? Well, it's the flu vaccine or the influenza vaccine. So awesome job to those of you that got that one. This vaccine usually administered during childhood is essential for preventing severe respiratory infections caused by bacteria like Streptococcus pneumoniae and Haemophilus influenzae. This one's a little more complicated so which vaccine usually administered during childhood is essential for preventing severe 
respiratory infections caused by bacteria like Streptococcus pneumoniae and Haemophilus influenzae. Which vaccine? Hmm, this one's a little more complicated, but I'm confident you got this. I'm seeing some correct answers already coming in. So we are looking for something that's going um, to prevent a infection that's caused by a bacteria. I'm seeing PCV, I'm seeing Hib, pneumococcal, I'm seeing PCV, I'm seeing Hib vaccine, I'm seeing pneumococcal, pneumococcal, Hib, Hib and pneumococcal conjugate. Hmm, let's check it out here. So this vaccine usually administered during childhood is essential for preventing severe respiratory infections caused by bacteria like Streptococcus pneumoniae and Haemophilus influenzae is going to be our pneumococcal conjugate or our PCV vaccine. Excellent job. Now remember, we are talking about things that are caused by bacteria versus a virus. Excellent job. Okay, which vaccine is given to infants? and young children to prevent immunity, excuse me, provide immunity against diseases like diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, which is whooping cough. This is our last question. Hang in there with me. We are almost done. Which vaccine is given to infants and young children to prevent, provide immunity against diseases like diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis? And we know that pertussis is that whooping cough vaccine so we're asking about children versus adults. We know there's two vaccines for this that cover the same things, but one is given to children, one, one is given to adults. Which one do we give to our children? Many of you are getting this. Excellent job. And remember, we have kind of a little bit of a hint there in the question. It's to provide immunity against diseases like diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis. You guys got it. You are awesome. So our answer here is the DTaP vaccine. So remember, that's a little bit different from the Tdap. Um, they're covering against the same things, but the DTaP we use for younger children and the Tdap we use for older children. If you think about it, I like to think about the big T as standing tall like an adult. So our Tdap goes to our adults and our older children, and our Dtap is going to go to our infants and younger children. Excellent job, guys. You did great with those questions. All right. The last thing I want to highlight is our Sure Pass combo. This is our number one recommended package. Um, we have two different options. We have an RN and an LPN option, depending on where you are. This includes your on-demand videos for you to be able to watch. It involves in it includes our QBank and also our next three-day live. Did you know every month we do a three-day live lecture? I like to call it nursing school boot camp. We're there for eight hours, nine hours a day. We're covering basics, high-yield test questions. We're covering um, your specialties, so maternity, mental health, many of our um, amazing tutors, many of our um, colleagues who have been nurses for years are in there. They are um, absolute people that know what's going on in the field of nursing, are experts in the field, are there that are leading you through um, those different topics from high yield test questions, how to break down test questions, prioritization, GI, endocrine, pharmacology, all of the things. Um, we look at uh, mental health, maternity, um, pediatrics, all of those things. We do that once a month. Um, this gets you access to that three-day live review. Our next one um, is going to be on December 6th, 7th, and 8th. 
Um, so like I said, this is our number one recommended package. I recommend this to um, everyone I talk to. Um, so we have an RN option and a PN option as well. All right, thank you so much for joining us today. I have enjoyed working with you. Many of you have um, amazing skills as you're reading through this information. Remember, if something is still a little bit sticky, write it down, go back and review it um, later on today. So remember, here at Archer, we are more than just test prep. We're your dedicated team of knowledge navigators. We are here for you. Um, we want to guide you and support you every step of the way. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you back in two weeks. Have a great day.